Football management trails only the music industry, and perhaps working for a drug cartel, when it comes to being one of the most cutthroat industries in the entire world. Just ask Claudio Ranieri, a man who won the Premier League title in his first season at Leicester City, in what was perhaps the greatest underdog story in world football for the past half century, only to lose his job following five straight defeats midway through the following season. Or Nigel Adkins, who guided Southampton to back-to-back -back promotions from League One to the Premier League in successive seasons, only to be sacked halfway through the Saints' first season back in the big time, despite the fact that his team was in 15th place in the Premier League with a three-point cushion above the bottom three. Yes, football management is a brutal old business, where even the very best can lose their jobs, with their employers often willing to stump up multi-million pound severance packages just to get rid of them, sometimes only months after they appointed them and presumably felt that they were the very best person for the job. Even the great Alex Ferguson was once sacked, by St. Mirren would you believe it, and though the future Aberdeen and Manchester United legend took the club to an industrial tribunal claiming unfair dismissal, he not only lost that tribunal, but he also had to hear St. Mirren chairman Willie Todd state, and I quote, that he had no managerial ability. So I thought that it would be interesting, following a suggestion from Don on Twitter it must be said, to take a look at a handful or so of current managers who have never been sacked, for now at least. Obviously, someone who has only recently started out in first team management, like Mikel Arteta or even Steven Gerrard never having been sacked, is less impressive than if someone like Roy Hodgson, for example, following 46 years in first team management and age 74, had never been sacked. Sadly, Roy has been sacked four times by my count, which still isn't bad going at all fairness. What does and doesn't constitute a sacking is also a rather contentious point since there are some departures that are chalked down as being mutual contract terminations rather than direct dismissals but are basically sackings, whereas there are some resignations or separations that genuinely are mutual. Laurent Blanc, for example, has technically never been sacked but was effectively sacked by PSG in 2016, and therefore he doesn't feature. Others are less straightforward, but if in doubt, I have considered it a sacking and ruled the manager in question out of contention. Right, after that beautifully rambling and yet still somehow not nearly long enough introduction, I'm sure you will all agree, here are seven current football managers who have, rather incredibly, still never been sacked. Seventh. Zinedine Zidane. The most contentious inclusion in this seven, and the manager that I came closest to leaving out, simply on account of him only ever having managed Real Madrid and Real Madrid Castilla, Zinedine Zidane has amassed a total of six years in first team football management without ever facing the axe. A three-time FIFA World Player of the Year, Zidane retired from playing football following the 2006 World Cup, having just turned 34 and it would be another four years before he returned to football in any official capacity. Zidane had shown few signs of an interest in coaching after hanging up his boots, but it was then Real Madrid boss Jose Mourinho, who in November 2010 asked Zizou to return to the Santiago Bernabeu as a special advisor who would sit in on training sessions and team meetings. The following summer, Zidane became Madrid's new sporting director, before being appointed as Carlo Ancelotti's assistant manager in 2013. Clearly having got a bit of a taste for coaching and management by that stage, in June 2014, he began coaching Real Madrid's second team, Real Madrid Castilla, despite the fact that he didn't actually yet have the relevant coaching badges at the time. Zidane first got the chance to manage Real Madrid's first team in January 2016, following the sacking of Rafa Benitez, and in many respects, it was the perfect timing. Los Blancos had a glittering team full of stars, just like the one that Zidane had played in at the Bernabeu, who had struggled with the disciplined and often rather defensive tactics that Benitez had looked to implement. Zizou took the shackles off the side, and whilst they were only able to win one league title, the Frenchman guided his former club to an incredible three Champions League crowns in the space of only three seasons. That is, the joint most Champions League titles that any manager has ever won, more than Alex Ferguson, and Zizou managed it in just two and a half years. 
Zidane resigned in 2018 before returning in 2019 for another two seasons in the Spanish capital, where he won another La Liga title before leaving the club of his own volition once again. Sixth, Didier Deschamps. There are those who feel that Didier Deschamps' current job ought to be under threat right now, and we'll come to the reasons behind that in just a moment's time. But it would be hard to deny that our second successive Frenchman is anything other than an outstanding manager who already has a world-class legacy as both a player and as a coach. Unlike his former teammate and fellow 1998 World Cup and Euro 2000 winner Zinedine Zidane, Deschamps always seemed destined to go into management. A coach of sorts before he even hung up his boots, Deschamps captained France to both of those successes, along with every team he ever played for. Having retired from football in 2001, aged only 32, he went immediately into management with AS Monaco. Deschamps won the Coupe de la Ligue title in 2003 and reached a Champions League final in 2004, so they didn't sack him. Instead, he resigned in 2005, owing to a disagreement with the club's president. Next up was the top job at Juventus, where he replaced Fabio Capello in the immediate aftermath of the Calciopoli scandal. Deschamps guided Juventus straight back to the top flight of the Italian game, winning the Serie B title, but resigned once again following that success, also due to clashes with the club's senior management. Following a couple of years out of the game, Deschamps was appointed as the new Marseille boss, and in his debut campaign, OM won their first league and title in 18 years. Deschamps won the Coupe de la Ligue crown in each of his three seasons at Marseille, before stepping down at the end of the 2011-12 season. That summer, France were knocked out in the quarterfinals of Euro 2012, and Deschamps replaced Laurent Blanc as Le Bleu's head coach. Now closing in on a decade in charge of the France national team, Deschamps' legacy could fairly be described as mixed, though that is perhaps a little bit harsh. His consistency up until Euro 2020 is absolutely undeniable, as France reached the quarterfinals of the 2014 World Cup, the final of Euro 2016, and won the 2018 World Cup. At Euro 2020, though, a tournament which they went into as the favourites, Deschamps' men were dumped out on penalties by Switzerland in the quarterfinals. Given France's squad is widely considered to be the strongest in Europe, if not the entire world, along with Deschamps' fairly conservative approach to games, there are some who would like to see a change of management, but they are unlikely to get it before the World Cup in Qatar. For now at least, Deschamps remains unsacked if that's a word, and I'm pretty sure that it isn't. Fifth, Marcelo Gallardo. A manager who I've talked about a fair few times on this channel, I must admit I am a little surprised that Marcelo Gallardo isn't yet working in Europe. Of course, he may have been offered a job or two in Europe, he may even have turned them down, and he may have no wishes whatsoever to leave River Plate. But given the balance of power in world football at this moment in time, and the reputation that Gallardo has developed, a return to Europe for the former league and star must surely become inevitable at some stage. A diminutive number 10 during his playing days, who won 44 caps for Argentina, Gallardo broke through as a 17-year-old at River Plate and earned comparisons with Diego Maradona. Despite two stints in France and one in the United States, he did spend the bulk of his career playing in South America and he actually retired in 2011 whilst playing for Uruguayan Giants Nacional. Nacional would also be Gallardo's first job in management, and he won the Uruguayan Primera Division in what would be his first and last season managing the club. It would be two years before Gallardo returned to management in 2014, appointed by his boyhood club River Plate following Ramon Diaz's shock resignation. In his almost eight years in charge of the club to date, Gallardo has won some 14 trophies, including the Copa Libertadores in 2015 and 2018. In 2021, Gallardo added the Argentine Primera Division title to his list of honours, River's first Primera Division title since 2008, so it is little wonder that he hasn't yet been sacked. Fourth, Graham Potter. Graham Potter, I only recently discovered, is a man who divides opinion. 
I think that is probably due to some people feeling the need to engage their contrarian tendencies in an effort to push back against some of the maybe slightly over-the-top praise that he has received at this stage. But I don't think that it is any secret that I like him a lot. Sure, his win percentage at Brighton may only be 27.6%, which isn't great, and you could argue that his teams often draw too many games. But I think that he is building something pretty impressive at Brighton. The Seagulls are 10th in the Premier League table, at least at the time of this recording, above the likes of Leicester City and Aston Villa, all whilst playing a style of football that I personally find among the most enjoyable to watch of any team in the league. Potter has always urged his teams to play progressive football, playing out from the back, and encouraging a tight bond within his dressing rooms. That may have been relatively straightforward to implement at Östersund in Sweden, where Potter spent seven years, won three promotions, and was able to mould the entire club in his fashion. Albeit, he did use some rather novel methods. But it was always likely to be more difficult to implement with bigger egos and a much bigger squad, with much more intense demands in the Premier League. In between his extraordinary success with Erstershund, a fairy tale that is now shrouded in controversy, which I covered in a thoroughly watchable documentary a little while back, if I do say so myself, and his arrival in the Premier League with Brighton, Potter also spent a season with Swansea City, which was the Swans' first season back in the Championship. Potter could only finish 10th in South Wales, so Brighton took a bit of a risk in appointing him doing so largely on the basis of the style of play that he was able to implement there. But it is a risk that has so far paid off. I personally think he is destined to one day get a go with one of the big boys, and the fact that he hasn't yet been sacked after over a decade in management sealed his spot in this seven. Third, Luis Enrique. One of three men currently being linked with the Manchester United job, along with Maurizio Pochettino and Eric Ten Hag, Luis Enrique is a man who started out in football management in 2008, and has still never been sacked. One of only a small number of players to have played for both Real Madrid and Barcelona, and an even smaller number to have actually played quite a lot of games for both of them, Enrique spent the last eight years of his career at Barcelona before retiring at the age of 34, despite having a contract offer on the table from his boyhood club Sporting Gijon, because he felt that he couldn't do himself justice following a string of injuries and fitness struggles. In his first foray into management, Enrique replaced Pep Guardiola as the manager of Barcelona's B team, where he helped the club return to the Segunda Division for the first time in 11 years. He resigned in March 2011, with Barca B on the verge of the playoffs, but ineligible to win promotion due to their B-team status, and he soon agreed a deal with AS Roma. In his only season at Roma, the club finished 7th, and whilst he still had two years left on his deal, he decided to walk away, taking a year out of the game. Upon his return to football, Enrique took Celta Vigo from relegation candidates to a top-half La Liga finish, beating Real Madrid along the way and that was enough to convince Barcelona to appoint him as their first team manager in 2014. In three seasons at Barcelona, Enrique won nine trophies, including two La Liga titles and the Champions League, but he left the club once his three-year deal came to an end. In July 2018, following another year-long hiatus, Enrique was appointed as the new boss of the Spanish national team. He stepped down for four months in 2019, following the tragic death of his nine-year-old daughter Shana, but is now back in post and guided Spain to the semi-finals of Euro 2020, where his side lost only on penalties to Italy, with a controversial 24-man squad that didn't contain a single player from Real Madrid. Second, Pep Guardiola. Speaking of highly successful, not once sacked former Barcelona players and managers, Pep Guardiola is widely regarded as being the finest manager in world football and one of the greatest managers of all time. I think that is a title that the Catalan has earned fairly, despite always having had very good players at his disposal, which some people never tire of pointing out as though it were somehow new or revelatory information. Across 15 years in management, Guardiola has only managed four teams, and one of those teams was the B team of another team that he managed. Barcelona B was Pep's first job in first team management, and it was a job that he had for just a year, 
before Barcelona gambled on him as Frank Reichardt's relatively inexperienced replacement in 2008. To say that it was a gamble that paid off would be a pretty drastic understatement. Trophyless for the past two seasons, and having just finished third in La Liga, 10 points behind Villarreal, and a mammoth 18 points behind Real Madrid, Guardiola exhibited his willingness to make very big decisions right from the off, selling the likes of Ronaldinho, Deco, and Gianluca Zambrotta. Barca won the treble in his first season, which was the first continental treble in the entire history of the club. In four seasons with his former club, Pep won 14 trophies, which I would assume without, you know, having done any research into the matter, because why would I, must be some kind of a record. At Bayern Munich, Guardiola won seven trophies in three seasons, and in his first five seasons at Manchester City, he has won 10 trophies, in addition to reaching a Champions League final. It is little wonder that he hasn't yet been sacked then, and Pep's list of accomplishments for a manager who is still only 51 years of age is pretty staggering. First, Jurgen Klopp. It is worth stressing that this seven is in no particular order, and the small number of managers who missed out did so fairly arbitrarily based upon who I wanted to include and which records of not being sacked I found more impressive, before anyone gets too annoyed with me in the comments. Nonetheless, I did save Jürgen Klopp for top spot rather than Pep Guardiola, since the German has spent a good bit longer in management and has never taken a hiatus like Pep did after leaving Barcelona. Also unlike Guardiola, Klopp did not have a distinguished playing career. He was a big utility man who spent 11 years with Mainz and never reached the Bundesliga. Klopp had begun coaching long before he even retired from playing the game though, coaching Frankfurt D Juniors, which was Eintracht Frankfurt's under-13 team, during his time with Eintracht 2, who are the club's reserve team. Upon his retirement whilst playing for Mainz in 2001, Klopp immediately took the reins as first-team boss, and his impact was immense. After guiding the club to safety and two failed promotion bids, Klopp took Mainz into the Bundesliga for the first time in the club's history, where they finished 11th and even qualified for the Europa League. Despite eventually succumbing to relegation, Klopp was not sacked, but he did eventually resign, having failed to win promotion back to German football's top flight at the first attempt. His reputation in German football was such that his next job was at Borussia Dortmund, who had just finished 13th in the Bundesliga. Over the next seven years, Klopp won two Bundesliga titles, finished as Bundesliga runners-up on a further two occasions, and reached the final of the Champions League, ensuring that the Bundesliga remained, briefly at least, a firm two-horse race. In October 2015, he was announced as Brendan Rodgers' successor at Liverpool, where he has performed nothing short of a miracle. The Premier League and Champions League titles that Liverpool have won on his watch, and preventing Manchester City from walking it in the Premier League every season, I genuinely think, are still vastly underrated achievements. Klopp has now spent more than 20 years in senior first-team management without any substantial break and without once being dismissed. And it is, once again, very easy to see why. Those are the seven that I chose to include, but I believe I'm right in saying that the likes of Diego Simeone and Julian Nagelsmann, as perhaps the two most high-profile examples, both also could have featured, along with a raft of less experienced and less high-profile managers, most of whom have only recently started out in the game. Thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed today's video. I sincerely hope that was the case. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you're subscribed, of course, to HITC7s. You can also find me on social media, on either Twitter or Instagram, via the username at HITC7s on both, should you wish to do so.